Section 1 of the Battle of Alatoona, October 5th, 1864. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jeffrey Smith. The Battle of Alatoona, October 5th, 1864, by William Ludlow. Companions and Gentlemen, and the General Situation. Companions and Gentlemen. It appears strange to me that an action which all who mention it, and they are many, agree in characterizing as one of the most brilliant exploits of a war as thick-set with deeds of gallantry as a rose-bush with its blossoms should not long since have had its adequate historian and monographer the contest was so famous the issue so glorious the recollection of the day still must be so vivid in the minds of the survivors that i could not anticipate any lack of material wherefrom to procure data to formulate a reasonably satisfactory narrative of such a gallant feat of arms and in such detail as to give it life and color but of all the war papers that have been written on affairs great and small none that i know has had alatoona for its special subject and from the sources of information at my command I have found it quite impracticable to construct an account that is not in some respect at variance with others made by authority. The official reports, while giving the general features, of necessity exclude most of the minor but equally interesting details, and the omissions, inaccuracies, and discrepancies, not important in some particulars, and material in others for the purposes at least of a fully detailed and authenticated narrative cannot at this time be corrected and even the numbers engaged on each side and of those who fell as victims are not known with certainty this paper therefore can pretend to be no more than an outline sketch which an abler hand must put itself to filling out and completing. When the war records shall have been made fully public, as they will be presently, and at least all the official material be available, the historian of Alatoona, by extended research and correspondence with survivors, should address himself to the task of preparing an authoritative narration in order to preserve to posterity the record of a memorable and typically american event for an event it was a vital one as it would appear to the full success of sherman's campaign and with the march to the sea hung in the balance and awaiting the issue the importance of a given moment in the world's history is not of necessity to be estimated by the numbers occupying the stage at the time, nor even with the degree of activity or turmoil with which their parts are playing. Much labor is wasted in the lives of men, and mountains of effort result often in mere noise or discomfiture, making no real history. The center of gravity of two worlds may be an immaterial point, and the earth itself revolves upon a slender axis. So a turning point of history may be concentrated upon a comparatively narrow field, while the reverberation of its potency shall resound forever, as the silent nod of Jove lets loose the thunders of Olympus to shake the earth and change the fate of nations. Some preliminary remarks are in order explanatory of the general situation and its relation to the battle of alatoona the general situation it was the fall of sixty four the fiery comet of secession that 
blazing out in 61, for three long years had scorched the firmament, spreading death and pestilence over all the land, was waning in its course, doomed presently to disappear forever in chaos, but emitting malignant emanations to its latest spark. The structure of the Confederate government, practically a military despotism, founded on the enforced servitude and sale of human beings, reared and upheld by the lives, the fortunes, and the constrained or misguided energies of a deluded and chivalrous people, to feed the vain ambition of an oligarchy, was toppling to the ruin that six months later overwhelmed it. Great was to be the fall thereof, and not even today is the atmosphere fully cleared of the dust of its destruction. Too famous, and as the outcome proved, morally conclusive campaigns had been fought and closed. In the East, Grant, moving against Richmond through the wilderness and swamps of Virginia, all the long summer had been dealing trip-hammer blows as deadly and sickening to his foe as the stroke of the axe in the shambles, and at length, resting from the slaughter, lay before Petersburg and astride the James. Feeling out with his left to cut Lee's lines of communication to the south and west, and pressing him close that he should not detach any of his force to act against Sherman. In the west, Sherman, starting from Chattanooga with an antagonist, the wariest, wisest, and most skillful captain of the rebel host to oppose him, had overreached his foe at every point, and stretching out his sinewy arm had seized in a relentless grasp the gate city of the south and electrified the country with the exultant shout atlanta is ours and fairly won opening wide the door into the hollow trunk of the confederacy and exposing its emptiness of this campaign halleck wrote i do not hesitate to say that it has been the most brilliant of the war and Grant himself, with that mutual magnanimity that characterized the two great friends and competitors for fame, declared to Sherman, You have accomplished the most gigantic undertaking given to any general in this war, and with a skill and ability that will be acknowledged in history as unsurpassed, if not unequaled. But much remained. The dragon of rebellion, though sorely smitten, still lay writhing and would not die until his time was fully come. Lee, sullen and desperate, lay within the still invincible entrenchments of Richmond, nursing his wounds, but with power able yet to strike a heavy blow, and gathering his remaining strength for the final effort. Sherman's antagonists, though demoralized and bewildered, were still unconquered, and forced out from Atlanta, filled the open country with an angry buzzing as of an overturned hive. To add to their discomfiture, the astute Johnson, the most intellectual soldier of the Confederacy, whose stubborn dispute of every inch of territory, perfect skill in defending his successive positions, and marvelous success in withdrawing without loss at the latest moment, displayed a capacity second only to that of his opponent, and whose patient policy of drawing Sherman after him to a constantly increasing distance from his base, without himself risking the disaster of a defeat, was, as history has proved, the last crutch of the rebellion, had been plucked from his command by the narrow-minded Confederate president, and replaced by Hood, whose fighting qualities had been proved on many a field of battle, 
but who otherwise lacked every requisite for leadership in such a contest but a thousand long miles still separated atlanta from richmond and these must be traversed before that proximate conjunction of forces could take place that was needed to give rebellion its coup de grace and to tear forever from the free sky of america the fluttering and ragged emblem of a maleficent and arrogant domination sherman in atlanta was resting granting well-earned furloughs to his veterans recruiting his ranks guarding from the cavalry who swarmed in his rear and sought to break it the extended line over two hundred fifty miles of railroad from nashville to chattanooga and thence to atlanta upon which he depended for his supplies and incessantly planning his next move which he had already determined would be to the sea with savannah as an intermediate base for the farther march to the rear of lee's army and a conjunction with grant upon whom in his correspondence he repeatedly urged assent to his proposal and suggested the capture of savannah by the eastern forces in advance of his own arrival there the washington authorities always timorous and vacillating were not yet brought to assent to this superb strategic project based upon the military theorem an army operating offensively must maintain the offensive and constructed with sherman's solid judgment that he must go onward since to withdraw would be to lose all the morale of his success up to that point even grant with all his confidence in and reliance upon sherman expressed unwillingness that he should embark upon it while hood's army was still undestroyed meanwhile sherman in full conviction that the necessity would presently be demonstrated was watching hood who lay some thirty miles to the southeast of atlanta and whose intentions he could not even guess at and with tremendous energy was endeavoring to accumulate supplies in excess of daily needs in order that when the time was ripe he should be ready to start end of the general situation Section 2 of the Battle of Alatoona, October 5th, 1864. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Battle of Alatoona, October 5th, 1864, by William Ludlow grand tactics and course grand tactics on his zigzag way south early in june with atlanta as his then objective point sherman with that wonderful mental vision of the whole horizon that characterized him seeking for a depot where supplies could safely be accumulated near enough at hand to be of ready access but sufficiently removed from the scene of actual conflict to be secure from casual attack had selected the famous alatoona pass and directed that it be prepared for defense as a secondary base the place was well chosen the diminishing extension of the great smoky mountains stretches across the northern end of georgia from northeast to southwest the range is traversed at alatoona pass by the etowah river flowing west and north to unite at rome thirty miles distant with the ustanala and form the coosa the railway coming down from kingston whence a branch ran westward to rome 
and crossing the Etowa, winds southeasterly among the hills, and at Alatuna Station, about four miles from the river, penetrates a minor ridge and emerges from a cut some sixty-five feet in depth. It was at this point, referred to by Sherman as a natural fortress, that the secondary base was established and the surplus supplies were accumulated. The advantages for defense were admirable. The entire region is hilly and heavily timbered, rolling off to the southward to a less rugged country, and from the heights of Alatoona looking southeasterly, down the line of railway towards Atlanta, are visible ten to fifteen miles away the noble isolated masses of Kennesaw, Lost Mountain and Pine Mountain, which, raising their wooded crests high above the neighboring forest, command a wide prospect towards every quarter. The narrow ridge cut by the railway is abruptly terminated to the northeast by the valley of Alatuna Creek, crooking among the hills to join the Etowa, and its slopes facing northwest and southeast are steep and difficult. Towards the west and southwest, the descent is more gradual, and a country road follows the rolling crest of the ridge along which, from the westward, the main attack was ultimately to be made. The storehouses for the supplies stood near the railway station and were fully commanded from the dominant elevations rising immediately behind them. Upon these elevations, the defensive works were located by Colonel Poe, the chief engineer of Sherman's army. Their plan was in conformity with the requirements of the ground and of the service to be expected of them, and while the actual construction by the troops left somewhat to be desired, and could have been bettered had Poe been able to supervise the completion of his work, when it came to the test, well did they serve their purpose. The main features were two redoubts, about 1,000 feet apart at easy supporting distance, one on each side of the railway cut, with ditches and outlying entrenchments near at hand covering the approaches, and overlooking the storehouses for the defense of which they were built. Near the close of September, Sherman, in Atlanta, was roused by indications of activity on the part of Hood, who had sent his cavalry north across the Chattahoochee and into Tennessee, and had moved his infantry to a more westerly camp, thus leaving the Savannah Road open to Sherman, had he seen fit to take it. Habitually sensitive as to his railway base, Sherman surmised that Hood's intention was to move round him to threaten his rear. September 24th, he telegraphed Howard, I have no doubt Hood has resolved to throw himself on our flanks to prevent our accumulating stores, etc. And September 25th to Halleck, Hood seems to be moving, as it were, to the Alabama line, leaving open to me the road to Macon, as also to Augusta, but his cavalry is busy on our roads. He therefore reinforced the detachments guarding the numerous railway stations and bridges, sent a division of the 4th Corps and one of the 14th northward to strengthen Chattanooga, and put Thomas in command there, and thence back to Nashville to guard against Forrest, the noted rebel cavalry leader who was ravaging Tennessee and capturing gunboats with horsemen. Corse's division of the 15th Corps was sent to occupy Rome on the extreme western flank with instructions to complete the defensive works and hold it against all comers, meanwhile observing closely any movement of the enemy in his vicinity. A glance at the map is desirable for the better understanding of the immediately ensuing events. From Atlanta to Alatoona, near the railway crossing of the Etowa, is, as the crow flies, 32 miles northwest by west. 
from Alatuna to Rome is 30 miles west-northwest. 13 miles from Alatuna towards Atlanta is Kennesaw, the railway sweeping round its north and east flanks. 15 miles west by south from Kennesaw, and the same distance southwest from Alatuna, is Dallas, in the vicinity of New Hope Church, where had been three days of heavy fighting late in May. Rome again is equidistant from Dallas and from Alatuna, 30 miles. The central position of Alatuna is evident, and it will also be seen that a force at Dallas occupied, in a sense, a strategic point, whence a rapid movement could be made either upon Alatuna or Rome, with the west and southwest to fall back upon in case of need. By October 1st, the ambiguity as to Hood's plans was in part relieved. It was at least certain that he had crossed from the south to the north bank of the Chattahoochee, although it was impossible to surmise whether he intended to make a direct attack on the railroad or to undertake an invasion of Tennessee from the westward. In any case, it behooved Sherman to bestir himself and promptly, too. It was absolutely necessary to keep Hood's army off the railroad so long as the question of cutting loose for Savannah remained undecided, and at Alatoona was stored an accumulation of nearly three millions of rations of bread, the loss of which, with the railway endangered, would be a serious blow and one possibly fatal to Sherman's cherished project. Leaving, therefore, the 20th Corps in Atlanta to hold it and to guard the bridges across the Chattahoochee above and below the railway bridge, Sherman put the rest of his forces in rapid motion, northward towards Kennesaw, 20 miles distant, and October 1st telegraphed course at Rome that Hood was across the river and might attack the road at Alatoona or near Cassville, on the north side of the Etowah, about midway between Rome and Alatoona. If Hood went to Cassville, course was to remain at Rome and hold it fast. If to Alatoona, course was to move down at once and occupy Alatoona, joining forces with troops in the vicinity for its defense while Sherman cooperated from the south. Repeated dispatches were sent to Alatoona, directing the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Tourtelot, to hold the place at all hazards, and that relief would be speedy. These have been paraphrased into, Hold the fort, for I am coming, which, set to an inspiring air, caught the ear of the country, and is still in active service. Sherman crossed the Chattahoochee October 3rd and 4th, and finding his wires cut north of Marietta, signaled to the station on Kennesaw and thence to Alatoona, over the heads of the enemy, a dispatch to be telegraphed to course at Rome, to move at once with all speed and with his entire command to the relief of Alatoona. Sherman himself reached Kennesaw early on the morning of the 5th, and from the summit, to use his own language, had a superb view of the vast panorama to the north and west. To the southwest, about Dallas and Lost Mountain, could be seen the smoke of campfires indicating the presence of a large force of the enemy, and the whole line of railroad from Big Shanty up to Alatoona, full fifteen miles, was plainly marked by the fires of the burning railroad. We could plainly see the smoke of battle about Alatoona and hear the faint reverberation of the cannon. The fact was disclosed that Hood lay in force near Dallas, fifteen miles to the west and south of Kennesaw, and had detached a heavy column eastward to destroy the railroad and capture the scattered garrisons including the all-important post of Alatoona. About 8.30 a.m., 
Alatuna signaled Kennesaw, Course is here with one brigade. Where is Sherman? As received at Kennesaw, this message read, Course is here with... My recollection is that while the signal officer was working his flag, it was cut from his hands by a fragment of shell, interrupting the message, the latter part of which was not received, or at least not recognized. I find, however, no official confirmation of this. The mutilated report gave Sherman immense relief, but left him to suppose that Corse had arrived with his entire division. Had he known that the reinforcement was only a portion of one brigade, his satisfaction would have been less. As he says himself, I watched with painful suspense the indications of the battle raging there, but about 2 p.m. I noticed with satisfaction that the smoke of battle about Alatuna grew less and less and ceased altogether about 4 p.m. Later in the afternoon, the signal flag announced the welcome tidings that the attack had been fairly repulsed. The signal officer at Kennesaw reports that Sherman at the time pronounced these signal messages worth a million dollars. Course Leaving now this bird's-eye view of what was happening, let us go back a little and follow Course's movements. He had arrived at Rome from Atlanta, September 27th, with two of his brigades, the third being already there, and thereafter had been busy, in accordance with his general instructions and frequent communications from Sherman, in organizing and equipping his command for the special work entrusted to him, which was in effect to reconstruct and perfect the earthworks and defenses so as to make rome impregnable to assault and at the same time to act as a corps of observation constantly feeling out for and spying after the enemy and ready should occasion offer to strike a heavy blow in any direction where he should be discovered it was isolated difficult and responsible service and a dangerous one, since the first contact might be with Hood's whole strength, but of the very first importance to Sherman, whose ignorance of Hood's schemes and inability to anticipate his movements, perplexed and harassed him, and upon course he mainly relied to discover, by any or all means, the movements and presence of the enemy. Course was well equipped for such service. He had acted as inspector on Sherman's staff, and stood high with his chief, both in personal regard and professional estimation. Of medium height, erect, active and alert, ambitious, combative, decided, of sound judgment and indomitable courage, the task of holding Alatuna could have fallen into no better hands. As Grant, giving over a page of his memoirs to mention of the battle, says of him, Course was a man who would never surrender. On the 3rd of October, Sherman sent him a warning to be wary that Hood was meditating some plan on a large scale, and at noon of the 4th, Course received the message already mentioned, by signal from Vinings to Kennesaw, thence to Alatuna, and thence by wire to Rome, summoning him instantly to the rescue of the threatened garrison. Course had fortunately already telegraphed to Kingston that cars be sent him. The train in moving to Rome was partly derailed, but the single engine and about twenty cars were ready by dark. On these was loaded a portion of one of his brigades under command of Colonel Rowett, namely, eight companies, 39th Iowa, 280 men, Lieutenant Colonel Redfield commanding, nine companies, 7th Illinois, 291 men, 
Lieutenant Colonel Perrin commanding. Eight companies, 50th Illinois, 267 men. Lieutenant Colonel Hanna commanding. Two companies, 57th Illinois, 61 men. Captain Van Steinberg commanding. Detachment of the 12th Illinois, 155 men. Captain Kohler commanding, making a total of 1,054 men, which with the ammunition for the division was all that the available transportation could accommodate. The train left Rome at 8.30 p.m. and reached Alatuna a little after midnight. The troops were debarked, the ammunition unloaded with all speed, and the train immediately started back to Rome for another cargo of troops. As it happened, in returning, possibly with undue haste, considering the rough and insecure condition of the track and roadbed, the train was again derailed, and in consequence no further reinforcements reached Alatuna until about 8 p.m. of the 5th, four hours after the battle was over. Course immediately took command, and after a rapid survey of the field with Tortolot, in the quiet of the starlit night, proceeded to make his dispositions for defense. End of Grand Tactics and Course Section 3 of the Battle of Alatuna, October 5th, 1864. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Battle of Alatuna, October 5th, 1864, by William Ludlow. The Defenses of Alatuna and the Morning of the Battle. The Defenses of Alatuna. Alatuna was garrisoned as follows. Ten companies, 4th Minnesota, 450 men, of whom 185 were recent recruits. Major Edson commanding. Ten companies, 93rd Illinois, 290 men, Major Fisher commanding. Seven companies, 18th Wisconsin, 150 men, Lieutenant Colonel Jackson commanding, a total of 890 men, organized as a brigade, with six guns of the 12th Wisconsin Battery under Lieutenant Amsden, number of men not given, and all under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Tourtelot of the 4th Minnesota, as earnest, brave, and steadfast a man in the discharge of duty as ever drew a sword. Prior to Corse's arrival, the little garrison, with a full consciousness of its responsibility for the defense of the post and of the safety of the huge accumulation of rations stored in the neighboring warehouses, warned of danger and later stimulated to the utmost endeavor by messages from Sherman and inspired by the calm and fearless determination of its commander had been busily preparing for the attack the two small redoubts one on each side of the railway cut have been mentioned the eastern one perhaps seventy-five feet in diameter stood at the extreme eastern end of the ridge looking into the valley of alatuna creek and distant about two hundred eighty yards from the railroad and 340 yards from the western redoubt towards which it had an open view guarding the crooked crest between the railroad and redoubt were three detached lines of entrenchments one looking southward towards the storehouse 200 yards distant and two guarding the northern aspect with flanks refused on each side of a ravine that lay between them and down which went a road to the northward. On the west side of the railway cut, and almost on its verge, stood the other redoubt, 
about 90 feet in diameter, occupying an elevation from which the ground fell in all directions. Westwardly, after a moderate dip, the ground rose again to a second elevation or spur, on which stood a house, distant from the redoubt, about 170 yards. Beyond this the ground again fell, and the road ran west and southwest, undulating with the roll of the ground. The exterior defenses of the west side, in addition to the ditches surrounding the redoubt, were a short line of entrenchments near the crest southwest of the redoubt, and a longer line of rifle pits lying completely across the ridge, beyond the house, and about 260 yards distant from the redoubt. These rifle pits, held by the 39th Iowa and the 7th Illinois, were later the scene of one of the most savage encounters in the history of the war. About three-quarters of a mile out on the road, occupying an open elevation, were still other small works and rifle pits, not, however, any portion of the regular defenses. They had low parapets, and were supposed to have been constructed by Johnston's army when it occupied the locality in June previous. It was from these outer works, which there was, of course, no serious attempt to hold, that our outposts were driven in by the arrival of French's troops on the morning of the 5th. Tourtelot was made aware on the third that the enemy was operating on the railroad south of him, and on the fourth was signaled by Sherman, through Kennesaw, that the enemy was moving upon him, and that he must hold out, but not till the evening of the fourth was any direct demonstration made on Alatoona. Feeling the paucity of his isolated force, he had worked night and day to construct and strengthen his defenses and mature his plans. The two redoubts were well located for mutual support, each being able to take in flank an enemy assaulting the other from the north or south. The relative disadvantage of the West Redoubt, irrespective of its exposure to the probable brunt of an attack, was the fact that higher elevations to the west and southwest partly commanded it. Tourtelot therefore built the rifle pits across the crest of the ridge to the westward with the object of holding off the enemy as long as possible, and if the crest were taken, of retiring to the redoubt, to reach which the enemy must cover a distance of some 220 yards without shelter. In addition, he partly enclosed the West Redoubt with a stockade at the junction of the outer slope and the surrounding ditch to prevent escalade if the enemy should reach it, slashed such timber as remained for Abydus, and collected some cotton bales with which to close the entrance. His gunners in the East Redoubt and the infantry as well on the east side of the cut were charged to watch the flanks of the West Redoubt and direct their fire so as to cover the slopes to the north and south of it. His garrison was depleted by his orders to maintain a force to guard the blockhouse at the bridge across Alatoona Creek, about two miles south of the post, where three companies of the 18th Wisconsin were stationed. They were summoned by French on his way to Alatoona to surrender, but refused and held the blockhouse. But as French was sullenly withdrawing after the battle, the post was heavily shelled and set on fire, and when the roof was blazing and the men suffocating with the heat and smoke, they surrendered. Four officers and eighty men being taken prisoners. These men, though included in the return of casualties of the 18th Wisconsin, were not concerned in the Battle of Alatoona. Tourtelot, on the evening of the 4th, apprehending a night attack which would impair the advantages of his position, 
strengthened his grand guard, barricaded as well as he might the roads to the south and west, and made arrangements to fire a house or two so as to illuminate the site of the little village and the storehouses. But about midnight was immensely relieved by the arrival of course, which more than doubled the strength of the garrison and made it possible to man the defenses with some measure of effectiveness. THE MORNING OF THE BATTLE There was but little delay in getting down to work. By two in the morning a rapid fire was opened on the skirmish lines, south of the post, as though the enemy were pushing up the railroad straight at the stores. Tortillard immediately dispatched the 18th Wisconsin to reinforce the outposts in that direction and an hour later Corse threw out a battalion of the 7th Illinois in further support. Five companies of the 93rd Illinois were also sent out to the westward, near the outlying works already referred to. At daybreak, under cover of a strong skirmish line, Corse withdrew the troops from the open ground in the vicinity of the village to the summit of the ridge, placing the 4th Minnesota and the 12th and 50th Illinois in the redoubt, and entrenchments on the east side of the railway cut, under the immediate command of Tertillot and himself occupying with the rest of his force, under the immediate command of Rowett, the western side, upon which it was evident the weight of the attack must fall. The 7th Illinois and the 39th Iowa, on the left and right respectively, facing west, were ordered to occupy the line of rifle pits crossing the ridge about 250 yards in advance of the redoubt. As no defenses intervened between this line and the ditch encompassing the redoubt itself, it was of vital importance to hold it and keep the enemy in check to the last moment, and the two regiments were instructed to maintain their position at all hazards. The event proved with what fidelity and devotion the trust was discharged. Three companies of the 93rd Illinois were stationed in the rifle pits adjacent to the West Redoubt, and the remainder of the troops were distributed forward on skirmish and outpost duty. The six guns of the battery were equally divided, two being stationed in each redoubt, with the third outside, behind a low parapet. The day broke calm and clear, with the crisp air and bright warm sun of that superb mountain region. Sherman, on Kennesaw, takes occasion to record it as a beautiful day, with some vague consciousness in his mind, perhaps, of the contrast between the shining peace that reigned above and the devil's work that in smoke in fury waged below. At half-past six a rebel battery of twelve pieces opened from an elevation three-quarters of a mile south and east of Alatoona, and for two hours maintained a furious cannonade that, concentrated upon the two redoubts, filled the air with smoke and fragments of shell, and deafened the ear with almost incessant detonations. Meanwhile, French's skirmish lines were vigorously pushed round to the west and north until, with the exception of the steep and timbered valley of Alatoona Creek on the extreme east, the garrison was completely invested. At 8.30, amid a temporary lull of the uproar that had prevailed, a flag of truce was sent in bearing the following message. It was dated, Around Alatoona, October 5, 1864, 7 a.m., Commanding Officer, U.S. Forces, Alatoona. Sir, I have placed the forces under my command in such a position that you are surrounded, and to avoid a needless effusion of blood, 
I call on you to surrender your forces at once and unconditionally. Five minutes will be allowed you to decide. Should you accede to this, you will be treated in the most honorable manner as prisoners of war. I have the honor to be very respectfully yours, S. G. French, Major General, C. S. A. In making his report subsequently, French endorses on a copy of this summons the following. Major Sanders, the bearer of this communication, was attacked while bearing the flag of truce. He delivered the communication to an officer and told him he would wait outside the works fifteen minutes for an answer. None came. None was sent. And so the attack was made. S.G.F. Major General Commanding Whatever may have been the external conditions that led to this view of the matter on the part of General French, there is no question that Corse did reply, and promptly and to the point. He wrote his answer on the top of a neighboring stump, and a splinter or two may have gotten in it. Major General French, C.S.A., etc. Your communication demanding surrender of my command, I acknowledge receipt of, and respectfully reply that we are prepared for the needless effusion of blood, whenever it is agreeable to you. I am very respectfully your obedient servant, John M. Corse, Brigadier General, Commanding U.S. Forces. When this reply had been dispatched, Corse remarked, They will now be upon us, and nothing remained but to notify the several commands of the purport of the correspondence, and to prepare for the bloody work that lay before them. French commanded a division in the corps of Lieutenant General Stuart, which had been dispatched by Hood eastward from Dallas to destroy the railroad, as witnessed by Sherman from the summit of Kennesaw, and his report, dated November 5, from which the following particulars of his movements are derived, is of great interest. Stewart had struck the railroad at Big Shanty, four miles north of Kennesaw, on the evening of October 3rd, and his three divisions labored all night at their task, completing it as far as Ackworth. This work accomplished, French's division was sent northward under direct orders from Hood, which are given in French's report and have some peculiar features. Both orders are dated October 4th, and were handed to French at Big Shanty by Stuart at noon. The earlier one said that French shall move up the railroad and fill up the deep cut at Alatoona with logs, brush, dirt, etc. Also that when at Alatoona, French was, if possible, to move to the Etowah Bridge, the destruction of which would be of great advantage to the army and the country. The second order again urged the importance of destroying the Etowah Bridge, if such were possible, and that as the enemy, Sherman, could not disturb him before the next day, he was to get his artillery in position and then call for volunteers with light wood to go to the bridge and burn it. The curious points about these instructions are, in the first place, the absurdity of a wearied body of troops undertaking such a task as that of filling up a railway cut sixty-five feet deep and some three hundred or four hundred yards long in the way described with logs and dirt and the futility of doing it if it were possible it would have taken french several days to fill up that cut even assuming him to be uninterfered with, and one day's labor would open it again. The second point is the absence of any reference to a garrison at Alatoona, or to the accumulation of stores there. 
French was a good soldier, and after stating in his report that as both he and Stuart knew the facts in the case and were aware of the large amount of stores, they considered it important that the place be captured, contents himself with saying dryly, it would appear, however, from these orders, that the general-in-chief was not aware that the pass I was sent to have filled up was fortified and garrisoned. The fact is that it requires something more than mere courage to command an army, and it seems likely that a few such specimens of leadership cost Hood the confidence of his subordinates, and thoroughly justified Sherman in a disparaging remark he made respecting him a day or two later. Stuart gave French twelve pieces of artillery under Major Myrick, and at 3.30 p.m. of the 4th he marched away to Ackworth, but was detained there until 11 at night by lack of rations. The night was dark, the roads bad, and he didn't know the country. From Ackworth he reports seeing night signaling between Kennesaw and Alatoona, and fearing that reinforcements might be sent from the northward, he dispatched a small cavalry force to reach the railroad as close to the Etowah as possible and take up the rails. It was a wise precaution, but undertaken too late, as course was at Alatoona by midnight. French arrived there about three in the morning, and, as he writes, nothing could be seen but one or two twinkling lights on the opposite heights, and nothing was heard except the occasional interchange of shots between our advance guards and the pickets of the garrison in the valley below. He placed his artillery in position at Moores, 1,300 yards south and east of the post, an admirable location for the purpose intended, having an open view of the defenses across the intervening hollow, left with it the 39th North Carolina and the 32nd Texas of Young's Brigade as supports and sought to gain the ridge west of the fortifications intending to attack at daybreak but after floundering in the egyptian darkness of the forest with no roads and over a rugged country and unavailingly seeking notwithstanding the aid of a guide to get upon the ridge westward of the works was compelled to wait for daylight finally at seven thirty the head of the column arrived about six hundred yards distant from the west redoubt and here french got his first view of the works which impressed him at once as much more formidable than he had anticipated instead of one small redoubt on each side of the railroad cut as he had been led to believe he declares he saw no less than three on the west side and a star fort on the east with outworks and approaches defended to a great distance by abatis and nearer the forts by stockades and other obstructions it may have been the weariness of a long night march or perhaps the too early morning air that conjured these formidable defenses to French's eyes, or possibly it is the exterior aspect of these works that to a covetous and hostile apprehension enlarges their numbers and proportions. It must be admitted that from the interior standpoint they shrunk mightily from French's description and the defenders at least would have been hugely gratified could they have had the privilege of occupying what French thought he saw. He rapidly made his dispositions for assault, sending Sears' Mississippi Brigade round by the left to gain the north flank of the works, while Cockrell's Missouri Brigade formed line across the ridge, with Young's Texas Brigade behind it, to support and follow up the attack. 
Myrick had been ordered to open up with his guns and continue his fire until the attacking troops were so close up to the works as to prevent it. Sears, having the longer distance to traverse, was to begin the assault when Cockrell would immediately move forward. Sears was delayed by the ruggedness of his route to the north side of the works, and in fact for a time lost his bearings among the wooded hills, and was not in position until 9 a.m. by French's time. French says that when he sent his summons to surrender, the Federal officer entrusted with the missive was allowed 17 minutes within which to bring the answer, and this time expiring, Major Sanders returned without any. Nothing is said in the report as to the firing upon him, noted in the endorsement on the copy of the summons already mentioned. End of the Defenses of Alatoona and the Morning of the Battle Section 4 of the Battle of Alatoona, October 5th, 1864. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Battle of Alatoona, October 5th, 1864. By William Ludlow. THE ASSAULT AND THE DEFENSE THE ASSAULT Cockrell was at length ordered forward, and the attack began. According to French's account, everything went as successfully as possible. He represents the triple lines of entrenchments and redoubts on the west side as being captured one after another, his troops resting but briefly at each to gather strength and survey the work before them, and again rushing forward in murderous hand-to-hand -hand conflict that left the ditches filled with dead until they were masters of the second redoubt, and the third or main redoubt was filled with those driven from the captured works and further crowded by the refugees from the eastern fort and its defenses, who had been driven out by the attack of Sears. He represents the Federal forces, their fire almost silenced, as being herded into the one redoubt on the west, of which French's troops occupied the ditch and were preparing for the final attack. At this critical moment, with the garrison and the precious stores, as it were, in the hollow of his hand, French received word that General Sherman, who had been repeatedly signaled during the battle, was close behind him with his whole army, and within two miles of the road he would have to take to rejoin his corps. On this point of Sherman's proximity to French as his reason for leaving, we have not only full knowledge of the exact position and movement of our troops to show that such was really not the case, but a brief piece of testimony from the other side in the shape of a dispatch from Major Mason, Hood's adjutant general, from which it is evident that French, becoming hopeless of success, had sought in advance to justify at headquarters the failure of his enterprise. The date and hour of this dispatch, which reads as follows, are of interest. Carley's House, October 5, 1864, 8 15 p.m. Lieutenant General Stewart, Commanding Corps. General French's dispatch, forwarded by yourself, is just received. General Hood directs me to say that he does not know where a division could march at this time to give any assistance to General French but that you will endeavor to send some scouts to him and direct him to leave the railroad and march to the west to New Hope Church. General Hood does not understand how General French could be cut off at the point he designates in his dispatch, 
as he should have moved directly away from the railroad to the west if he deemed his position precarious a p m it is of course obvious from the map that if french found sherman approaching from the south he had only to follow westward the road up which he had been charging at alatoona all day and free himself from danger in an hour it would be of interest to see this dispatch of french's and observe the hour when sent but it is not forthcoming the hour of the reply is significant it need not have taken a mounted man three hours to get word to stuart then near a junction with hood and to hood himself less than fifteen miles away the reply made at once is written at eight fifteen p m and french's message must certainly have been sent later than four p m and french's message must certainly have been sent later than four p m french had probably been gone from alatoona an hour or more when he bethought him to send the request for a division to extricate him the facts are that it was not until the night of october fifth that the nearest troops of sherman's went into camp at brushy mountain eleven miles distant in an airline and none reached alatoona until the seventh but to return to french it was really an immense pity that he should feel obliged to leave just when he had but to put forth his hand to snatch the prize but then it would not do to have his division cut off from the army and on the whole it might be well to start and if so why not at once so about one thirty he says an order was sent to sears and cockrell to withdraw the ground was too rough to carry badly wounded men over it so that those who could not get away on their own feet had to be left the artillery unable to operate effectively with the assaulting column close up on the works had already been in part ordered to take the road and after the assaulting troops had left french went to the two regiments who had supported it and sent a battery to the blockhouse at the railway crossing of alatoona creek fired fifty shots at it knocked it about the ears of the garrison and setting fire to it smoked them out and marched them off as prisoners french's report of this affair written a month later from which the above is condensed is very interesting and dramatic and regarded as a literary composition of no mean merit he has certainly made the best of a bad business and if his facts do not quite tally with those of his opponents at least the discrepancies were not officially noticed at headquarters nor probably would a gloomier account of the affair have been considered more inspiriting those rations would have been extremely convenient could they or even a part of them have been hauled away for distribution among the hungry confederates and if that were impracticable it would have been at least a noble stroke to have destroyed them on this head french's report is silent nor does he endeavor to explain how it happened that so vital a part of his own program was omitted in effect the play had been badly broken up by the attentions of the gallery and hamlet had slipped out of it french is without excuse for his fear of sherman's approach baseless as we know it to have been armstrong is responsible for dispatches to him suggesting it all the same the evidence is conclusive that french was beaten that he knew it and that he had to withdraw quite independently of sherman's movements a confederate historian k s bevier writes as follows on this point the men of french's division had now become so much scattered that it was impossible to gather a sufficient number to give any hope of successful assault on the fort 
what can wholly be pardoned to french is the unstinted commendation he bestows on the gallantry of his men these poor fellows ragged and hungry with but a handful or two of parched corn in their haversacks had marched all day on the third had worked all that night destroying the railroad had worked and marched all day on the fourth had marched to alatoona during that night and had fought nearly all day on the fifth nor is it forbidden to those who felt the vigor of their dashing onset and the undaunted determination with which they rallied again and again to the assault of the entrenchments or who witnessed the hand-to-hand -hand encounters with sword and bayonet with butts of guns and even with loose pieces of rock to appreciate the intrepidity and resolution with which they hung to their bloody and fruitless task brave men may honor bravery the world over we can in all sympathy and common brotherhood say they were of our blood and race peace to their ashes give us the like to stand side by side with us and we could fear no quarrel were it with the whole round world the defense having glanced at the situation from french's standpoint let us step over to the other side as we may safely do at this lapse of time and see how it actually fared with the beleaguered garrison which we left in momentary expectation of attack and since general french has been heard it is no more than fair to quote from the graphic reports of the federal commander after narrating his preliminary movements and the stations of the troops he proceeds i directed colonel rowett to hold the spur on which the thirty ninth iowa and seventh illinois were formed and taking two companies of the ninety third illinois down a spur parallel with the railroad and along the bank of the cut so disposed them as to hold the north side as long as possible three companies of the ninety-third which had been driven from the west end of the ridge were distributed in the ditch south of the redoubt with instructions to keep the town well covered by their fire and to watch the depot where the rations were stored the remaining battalion of the ninety-third under major fisher lay between the redoubt and rowett's line ready to reinforce wherever most needed i had barely issued the orders when the storm broke in all its fury on the thirty ninth iowa and seventh illinois young's brigade of texans had gained the west end of the ridge and moved with great impetuosity along its crest till they struck rowett's command when they received a severe check but undaunted came again and again rowett reinforced by the gallant redfield encouraged me to hope we were safe here when i observed general sears brigade moving from the north its left extending across the railroad opposite tortillot i rushed to the two companies of the ninety-third illinois which were on the brink of the cut running north from the redoubt they having been reinforced by the retreating pickets and urged them to hold on to the spur but it was of no avail the enemy's line of battle swept us back like so much chaff and struck the thirty-ninth iowa in flank threatening to engulf our little band without further ado fortunately for us colonel tortillot's fire caught sears in flank and broke him so badly as to enable me to get a staff officer over the cut with orders to bring the fiftieth illinois over to reinforce rowett who had lost very heavily however before the regiment sent for could arrive sears and young both rallied and made their assaults in front and on the flank with so much vigor and in such force as to break rowett's line 
and had not the thirty-ninth iowa fought with the desperation it did i never would have been able to get a man back inside the redoubt as it was their hand-to-hand -hand conflict and stubborn stand broke the enemy to that extent that he must stop and reform before undertaking the assault on the fort under cover of the blows they gave the enemy the seventh and ninety-third illinois and what remained of the thirty-ninth iowa fell back into the fort the fighting up to this time about eleven a m was of the most extraordinary character attack from the north from the west and from the south these three regiments thirty-ninth iowa and seventh and ninety-third illinois held young's and a portion of sears and cockrell's brigades at bay for nearly two hours and a half the gallant colonel redfield of the thirty-ninth iowa fell shot in four places and the extraordinary valor of the men and officers of this regiment and of the seventh illinois saved to us alatoona so completely disorganized were the enemy that no regular assault could be made on the fort till i had the trenches all filled and the parapets lined with men the twelfth and fiftieth illinois arriving from the east hill enabled us to occupy every foot of trench and keep up a line of fire that as long as our ammunition lasted would render our little fort impregnable the broken pieces of the enemy enabled them to fill every hollow and take every advantage of the rough ground surrounding the fort filling every hole and trench seeking shelter behind every stump and log that lay within musket range of the fort we received their fire from the north south and west of the redoubt completely enfilading our ditches and rendering it almost impracticable for a man to expose his person above the parapet an effort was made to carry our works by assault but the battery twelfth wisconsin was so ably manned and so gallantly fought as to render it impossible for a column to live within one hundred yards of the work officers labored constantly to stimulate the men to exertions and almost all that were killed or wounded in the fort met their fate while trying to get the men to expose themselves above the parapet and nobly setting them the example the enemy kept up a constant and intense fire gradually closing around us and rapidly filling our little fort with the dead or dying about one p m i was wounded by a rifle ball that rendered me insensible for some thirty or forty minutes but managed to rally on hearing some persons cry cease firing which conveyed to me the impression that they were trying to surrender the fort again i urged my staff the few officers left unhurt and the men around me to renewed exertions assuring them that sherman would soon be there with reinforcements the gallant fellows struggled to keep their heads above the ditch and parapet in face of the murderous fire of the enemy now concentrated upon us the artillery was silent and a brave fellow whose name i regret having forgotten volunteered to cross the railway cut which was under fire of the enemy and go to the fort on the east hill to procure ammunition having executed his mission successfully he returned in a short time with an armload of canister and case shot about two thirty p m the enemy were observed massing a force behind a small house and the ridge on which the house was located distant northwest from the fort about one hundred fifty yards the dead and wounded were moved aside so as to enable us to move a piece of artillery to an embrasure commanding the house and ridge a few shots from the gun threw the enemy's column into great confusion which being observed by our men caused them to rush to the parapet and open such a heavy and continuous musketry fire that it was impossible for the enemy to rally from this time until near four p m 
we had the advantage of the enemy and maintained it with such success that they were driven from every position and finally fled in confusion leaving their dead and wounded and our little garrison in possession of the field the hill east of the cut was gallantly and successfully defended by colonel turtelot with the fourth minnesota and a portion of the eighteenth wisconsin which was drawn from outpost duty towards the south about ten thirty colonel turtelot though wounded in the early part of the action remained with his men until the close and rendered valuable aid in protecting my north front from the repeated attacks by sears brigade a notable struggle truly and stirringly told even though the limitations of an official report forbid that amplification of incident that would make as thrilling a tale as tongue could utter from start to finish seven solid hours of as desperate fighting as ever was done under the sky of heaven and with multiplied acts of individual heroism that would tax the pen of homer to narrate with the exception of about two hundred fifty rounds the supply of ammunition brought from rome for the entire division had been expended by a portion of a single brigade every one of the subordinate commanders reports on both sides bears testimony to the unparalleled fierceness and concentration of the struggle and the closeness and duration of the action and the terrific slaughter and these reports it may be noted are made by the ruggedest of sherman's and french's veterans men inured to war in every aspect and as familiar with bloody battlefields as we of to-day with the street we daily tread in reading these scant records one scarce knows whether to admire the more the daring vigor and persistence of the attack or the spirit valor and heroic determination of the defense with both it was to do or die and each can feel that none save his rival can challenge supremacy in warlike exploit course's signal dispatch to sherman after the fight can therefore well be excused i am short a cheekbone and an ear but able to whip all hell yet End of the Assault and the Defense Section 5 of the Battle of Alatoona, October 5, 1864 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Battle of Alatoona, October 5th, 1864, by William Ludlow. Incidents of the Battle and the Stores Saved Incidents of the Battle It is a thousand pities that the many notable incidents of this fight are not on record, but so far as I am aware, no one has sought to gather them in any complete and authentic form course caught his wound about one o'clock while scanning the movements and position of the enemy from the redoubt it was a close call for his life the ball ploughing his cheek and splitting his ear and as might be imagined dazing him a surgeon took him in charge and ministered as well as the circumstances permitted at intervals course was unconscious but rallied from time to time as though the spirit within him crowded itself up through the physical deadening of his senses at one of these occasions he caught the words cease firing and as mentioned in his report feared some attempt to surrender on this point in a private letter he speaks as follows do you remember our losing a large number of springfield rifled muskets that exploded near the muzzle after becoming foul from overshooting 
i saw some that had exploded say about the shank of the bayonet it was so phenomenal as to make a decided impression on my mind at the time i think a large number of these must have been lost and when the order was given to cease firing it was under the impression that if the men were not given a chance to clean their guns we would lose them all and be overwhelmed my impression you remember at the time was that the order to cease firing meant surrender but rowett removed that impression in subsequent interviews during and after the war rowett's order to cease firing had of course nothing to do with the cry of surrender it is true that there were men in that redoubt ready to surrender or to do anything else in order to get out of it alive happily these were few and most of them lay prone close under the parapet playing dead with the combatants and wounded standing and sitting upon them if i mistake not course himself at least for a time was holding down of these living corpses who preferred to endure all the pain and discomfort of his position rather than get up and face the deadly music that filled the air with leaden notes it came about this way the redoubt was crowded and as bloody as a slaughter pen in its actual construction the parapet encircled a higher elevation in the center which had not been sufficiently excavated so that a man standing or in fact lying in the middle of the work was exposed to bullets coming in close over the parapet it was absolutely necessary to keep room for the fighting force along the parapet so the wounded were drawn back and in some cases were shot over and over again the dead were disposed of in the same way except that as the ground became covered with them they were let lie as they fell and were stood or sat upon by the fighters several of the skulkers lay among these but a few were in the ranks the slaughter had been frightful one of our guns was disabled from the jamming of a shot and we were out of ammunition for the other two thereby losing both the deterrent effect upon the enemy and the moral encouragement that the friendly roar of cannon always gives to infantry in action i recall distinctly the fact that a regimental flagstaff on the parapet which had been several times shot away fell again at a critical moment towards the end of the action there was a mad yell from our friends outside and a few cries of surrender among our own people but a brave fellow leaped to the summit of the parapet where it did not seem possible to live for a single second grasped the flagstaff waved it drove the stump into the parapet and dropped back again unhurt of course nobody knows the name of that man but his action restored confidence and a great yankee cheer drowned the tumult and no cry of surrender was afterwards heard what saved us that day among forty other things was the fact that we had a number of henry rifles sixteen shooters since improved and known as winchesters these were new guns in those days and rowett as i remember had held in reserve a company of an illinois regiment that was armed with them until a final assault should be made when the artillery reopened after the incident related by course of the man crossing the cut and coming back with an armful of case shot this company of sixteen shooters sprang to the parapet and poured out such a multiplied rapid and deadly fire that no men could stay in front of it and no serious effort was thereafter made to take the fort by assault it is not possible within any reasonable limits for a paper already too long for your patience to undertake the recital of the numerous thrilling incidents one may be mentioned 
an artillery sergeant whose gun was at first stationed outside the fort behind an exterior parapet was driven in by the rush of the enemy and his men being all killed he had to abandon it wounded himself in several places he came into the redoubt frothing with rage at the loss of his peace and demanded a crew of volunteers to go out with him and get it notwithstanding the deadly fire he got them and in three minutes was back with his recovered prize with more wounds to his account a bloodier man was never seen but he kept at his work loading and firing until a musket ball passed through his neck and he dropped dead the same ball traversed the body of an iowa officer with whom i was standing further back and then struck me with force enough to take my breath that ball had killed two men and i preserved it with the name and date of the battle scratched on its but slightly distorted surface on turtelot's side a grim war comedy was enacted the remains of two mississippi regiments the thirty-fifth and thirty-ninth of sears brigade that had charged with desperation found themselves as the surge of battle that broke upon the hill went back lodged in a sheltered depression of the north front whence they could move neither up nor down without concentrating upon themselves the fire of Turtelot's whole front. Unable to determine what course to take, they remained where they were to think it over, and Turtelot, observing their embarrassment, thoughtfully sent a portion of the 4th Minnesota to their rescue and invited them to come in. One field and several line officers, and eighty men with the colors of the two regiments, were the reward of the yankee courtesy after the fight was over we thankfully emerged from the shambles and went out to survey the field the dead the dying and the wounded lay everywhere the ditches immediately outside the redoubt were crammed with corpses there were dead rebels within one hundred feet of the work and they were piled in stacks near the house where they had massed for the final assault which was never made against the reopened artillery and the rattle of the henry rifles but the appalling centre of the tragedy was the pit in which lay the heroes of the thirty ninth iowa and the seventh illinois such a sight probably was never before presented to the eye of heaven there is no language to describe it with all the glad reaction of feeling after the prolonged strain of that mortal day and the exultant surge of victory that swelled our hearts it was difficult to stand on the verge of that open grave without a rush of tears to the eye and a spasm of pity clutching at the throat the trench was crowded with the dead blue and homespun yank and johnny inextricably mingled in their last ditch our heroes ordered to hold the place to the last with supreme fidelity had died at their posts as the rebel line run over them they struck up with their bayonets as the foe struck down and rolling together in the embrace of death we found them in some cases mutually transfixed the theme cannot be dwelt upon for relief take another one so unique in the circumstances that i doubt at times my own recollection of it it was in the morning when french first gained the west end of the ridge the ninety-third illinois was in the vicinity of the outworks a quarter of a mile or so from the redoubt i had been reconnoitering the ground and the rebel column charged us sharply and without warning we ran of course but in passing through or rather over an old work of low relief one of our men stooped grabbed a brick and turned 
Curiosity overcame discretion, and I had to look. He threw the brick straight as a bullet at a rebel running toward us, and if I may be believed, the brick caught the man full in the face, and he went down like a log. One more incident, and I am done. After the battle, the wounded of both sides were collected, housed, and cared for. One of the surgeons invited me to come to the hospital with him, and on the way said he had a wounded woman there. I expressed surprise, and he said, See if you can pick her out. We went through the hospital, and I saw no woman, but passing through again on the way back, the doctor stopped at a bed where a tanned and freckled young rebel, hands and face grimy with dirt and powder, lay resting on an elbow, smoking a corncob pipe. The doctor inquired, how do you feel? And the answer was, pretty well, but my leg hurts like the devil. As we turned, the doctor said, that is the woman, and told me that she belonged to the Missouri Brigade, had had a husband and one or two brothers in one of the regiments, and followed them to the war. When they were all killed, having no home but the regiment, she took a musket and served in the ranks. Like an actor of the old Greek dramas, war has its two masks of tragedy and comedy, although it is difficult at times to determine to which the antiphonal scene belongs, so of this case. It is perhaps not proper in such a paper as this to expose or call attention to the shifts to which the Confederates were forced to fill their ranks, but the incident may be told nevertheless. THE STORES SAVED The stores which had cost such heroic endeavor and expenditure of life were saved. The stores which, as Course says in a private letter, would have been such a prize as Hood, in all his long and bloody career as a soldier, had never secured. This fact is due, independently of the main action, largely to the coolness and vigilance of Tortolot, who, in addition to fighting Sears on his north front and flanking the attacks on the west redoubt, kept his mind charged with the protection of the warehouses, even while his wound forced him to physical inaction. As has been stated, he pushed out the 18th Wisconsin to the southward to hold back the two regiments which were in front of the rebel batteries, and only withdrew them at 10.30 when the assaulting column had reached a point in front of the West Redoubt whence it had a fire upon the rear of the outlying command. Thereafter, Tortolot kept a wary eye out towards the stores, with men in his southern rifle pit and its vicinity constantly on guard, and cautioned to unceasing vigilance, and although several attempts were made by individuals and small parties to reach the warehouses and fire them, they died on the way, and none of them ever attained their destination we found several bodies scattered about in the vicinity, and one of them within twenty feet of the buildings, with the implements in his hand for firing them. As to the amount of these stores, General Sherman, in his memoirs, says there were over a million rations of bread, probably with Corse's report at hand, in which the number is incorrectly stated at that amount. Cox, in his Atlanta, gives it more accurately at nearly three millions. The actual figures, two million seven hundred thousand, are given in a letter from Sherman to Course in acknowledging, on October 7th, Course's preliminary report of the same day. End of Incidents of the Battle and the Stores Saved Section 6 of the Battle of Alatoona, 
October 5, 1864. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Battle of Alatoona, October 5, 1864, by William Ludlow. The Losses, Reporting to Sherman, and Conclusion. The Losses. Course's losses in this battle, from the full official records, were 142 killed, 352 wounded, and omitting those captured at the blockhouse, two miles away, 128 prisoners. A total loss of 622, nearly one-third of his entire command. French, in his report, estimates that he had killed and wounded 750 and captured 205, which, with the blockhouse prisoners, would make a total loss inflicted on course of over 1,000, which is over 50 percent. Too much. French's losses are not known. With his report he gives a tabulated list of casualties by brigades, which shows footings of 122 killed, 443 wounded, and 243 missing, a total of 799. Sears, however, whose report of casualties is the only one accessible to me, reports in his brigade alone a total loss of 425 as against 351 attributed to him in French's schedule, which is an increase of 21 percent. Young and Cockrell must have lost at least as heavily as Sears, and having charged our line repeatedly and had several encounters at close quarters, probably more so. Allowing for these facts, it is perhaps nearer correct to increase French's statement of loss by 25 percent, which would make it almost exactly 1,000 men. As Corse actually buried 231 rebel dead, captured 411 prisoners, well and wounded, and picked up 800 stand of arms, and as French left behind him, according to his own account, only those of his wounded who needed litters to move them, we must add to the 644 rebels accounted for by Corse at least 400 or 500 wounded who got away when French left or previously. French's total loss could not have been much less than 1,100 or 1,200. The number of troops with him cannot be determined. He gives it as but little over 2,000 men, in which case he lost more than half his entire number, but he omits three regiments as forming no part of the assaulting column. He refers to those supporting the artillery, but these men were in the engagement, kept the 18th Wisconsin in their front, and French thanks their leader, Colonel Andrews, who commanded on the south side, and Major Myrick, who commanded the artillery. French's field report for September 24th showed present for duty 331 officers and 2,945 men, an effective present of 3,626, and an aggregate present of 4,347. He probably had not less than 3,000 with him at Alatoona engaged in action, in which case his total loss was proportionally the same as ours, namely about one-third. Reporting to Sherman On the morning of the 7th, Corps sent me down to Kennesaw to take his report to Sherman and supplement the gaps in the information which his wound forbade elaborating. 
as i reached the summit of the mountain conscious of bearing welcome and important tidings of great joy and considering what special form sherman's delight might take i found him surrounded by a group of generals and staff scanning with binoculars the long clouds of dust that rising above the forest to the westward betokened a great movement of troops it was hood en route northward as sherman turned and saw me his greeting was hello how's course i answered that he was doing very well and sherman glanced over the report which i handed him and inquired pretty hot wasn't it and without waiting for an answer said i knew it was all right when course got there i'll write him presently as i stood anxiously waiting an invitation to unbosom myself of the accumulated information that it wearied me to carry he turned back to take another look at hood and someone asked general what do you think hood is going to do sherman replied with an outburst of irritation how the devil can i tell if it were joe johnston now johnston was a sensible man and did sensible things hood is a damn fool and is liable to do anything this view of his antagonist is it will be observed paraphrased in his letter to course written immediately after into hood is eccentric but his off-hand response was substantially as i have given it my interview was over nor since that time until this evening have i had a chance to unload conclusion this practically closes the sketch of alatoona i can only hope that it will avail to furnish some material for a proper history of that memorable affair sherman published his congratulatory special field orders number eighty six dated october seventh proclaiming the vital military principle that fortified points must always be defended to the last regardless of numbers declaring the effusion of blood at alatoona not useless as the position was and is very important to present and future operations and thanking course and tortillat and their men for their determined and gallant defense just how important to his future operations was the successful defense of alatoona may be judged from what followed october ninth sherman telegraphed to grant with renewed urgency that the march to savannah must be made and stated to show his preparation we have on hand over eight thousand head of cattle and three million rations of bread in other words the alatoona stores two million seven hundred thousand rations were practically all he had sherman impatiently chased hood northward seeking to corner and devour him but hood living off the country and traveling light could go two miles to sherman's one and there was no catching him weary of the harassing and fruitless hunt sherman insisted that his march to savannah be not delayed and on october nineteenth to be in readiness for it telegraphed his chief commissary at atlanta have on hand thirty days food say one million eight hundred thousand rations two-thirds of the alatoona stores which were supplies for sixty thousand men for forty-five days november second grant for the first time authorized the march sherman abandoned hood to his own devices and the unhappy rebel leader pressing northward was heavily thrown in his encounter with schofield at franklin and finally dashed himself to pieces against the rock of chickamauga the noble george h thomas lying vigilant within the defenses of nashville and like an old lion silently licking his chops as he watched his prey draw nigh 
november twelfth sherman having stripped his railroad cut the telegraph wires that no message of delay might reach him loaded his teams marched his sixty thousand men for savannah and although he lived off the country got there with empty wagons with hood and forest in his rear and on his railroad how was he to accumulate a fresh store of provision and what would have become of the march to the sea if alatoona had been lost end of the losses reporting to sherman and conclusion end of the battle of alatoona october fifth eighteen sixty four